The soundtrack to the first Sonic the Hedgehog game was composed by Masato Nakamura, primarily known as the bassist and lead songwriter for Japanese pop giant Dreams Come True. Sega decided to bring him on as composer to appear more hip and youthful, but Nakamura managed to provide an amazing soundtrack, bringing a pop sensibility to the game's music that still feels fresh and exciting 25 years later. The compositional style and instinct on display is so unique, I thought it would be fun to take it apart and see what I could find. First off, let's talk about harmony. The Sonic soundtrack is rooted in a pop ideology, and something that's typical of pop writing is the absence of too many strong resolutions. Now the first chord progression most music students learn is the 5-1 progression because it's such a strong resolution. And because it kind of symbolizes the whole concept of tension and release in music. Basically the 5 chord is the setup, and the 1 chord is the punchline. The problem with the 5-1 progression is that it's such a strong resolution that at some point in the last 400 years or so, it became predictable. If you hear a 5 chord, you're going to expect the 1 chord to come next, whether subconsciously or not. But just like when you're watching a movie, you don't always want to know what comes next. Great movies and great compositions find a balance between keeping their audience guessing and giving them what they want. So in Sonic's soundtrack, you don't find a lot of 5-1s. In fact, there are so few clear instances of this, I could count them on one hand. Nakamura prefers to resolve with more nuanced progressions. Listening to the soundtrack, the chord progression that stood out to me the most was the 4-3-2-1. It's kind of a deviously simple progression, just walking down the major scale from 4 to 1, but it creates this vibe that I've come to associate pretty much entirely with Sonic's soundtrack. Because it's a walk down the major scale, the resolution is very clear. We don't have to guess what key we're in. But moving from the 2 to the 1 is not nearly as traditionally strong as moving from the 5 to the 1, so the resolution is less like cannonballing into a pool than it is like sinking into a hot tub. Nakamura also usually makes these chords diatonic 7 chords, adding an extra color note from the major scale to give the progression a floaty, dreamlike quality. That's enough explaining though, let's look at some examples. You'll hear it first in Green Hill Zone, where it plays behind the main melodic section. We hear the 4-3 half repeated before we get the full walk down, which is a good way to lengthen a progression and it supports the A-A-A-B structure of the melody quite nicely. Next you'll hear it in Spring Yard Zone, where the bridge plays a light childish melody to contrast the slinky, greasy, funk A section. In this iteration, the chords are all triads with no sevenths, so it feels a little less dreamy and a little more rugrat. We'll talk more about contrasting sections in a bit, but it's interesting to note that the bridge is in F major, which is the relative major, to the A section's key of D minor. Seeing this piece, I can't help but feel that Nakamura uses this progression as a go-to whenever he needs a major key section. We also hear it in Labyrinth Zone's bridge, with a deceptive move to the dominant 6 chord halfway through. I like how Nakamura isn't afraid to mess with progressions he likes, and the 6-7-4 to four movement is so weird and cool it kind of makes the song for me. It works because A7 is the 5 in the key of D minor, and F is the relative major to D minor. It's a deceptive resolution that you don't see too often. The Special Zone's A section is entirely made up of this progression. There's not much to say about it other than that it's a really clear example of the 4-3-2-1, so if you're having trouble hearing it still, give this a listen. <music> Lastly, Starlight Zone's bridge gives us the reversal of the 4-3-2-1 with a 1-2-3-4 progression. You can hear how having the one chord on the first bar of the phrase, a much stronger part of the four bar phrase structure than the fourth bar, really changes the feeling of the progression. The fact that it's ascending is also a big part of this change in tone. There are a few other ways Nakamura avoids the five chord. He'll often sub it out for the flat seven chord like at the end of Labyrinth Zone's bridge, or in the intro to Scrap Brain Zone. 
if he does have to use a 5 chord, he'll often make it into a 5 sus chord just to soften the resolution a bit and keep from breaking up the music's energy. In minor keys we see the 5 chord a lot more often, but it's usually a 5-7 sharp 5 which adds some color. Another cool harmonic trick we see in minor keys is the chromatically descending tonic. Here it is in Starlight Zone. We see the reverse of this technique, the chromatically ascending fifth, in Scrap Brain Zone. This is a decently common technique composers use, and the chromatically rising fifth on a minor chord is usually associated with the James Bond soundtrack. Structurally, all the pieces are basically the same. We get either a simple A-B form that repeats endlessly, or just an A section that repeats endlessly. We almost always get a one or two bar intro, but in a couple cases there's no intro at all. The bridges always contrast the A section in some way. Minor songs typically move to the relative major key, and major songs typically introduce some form of mode mixture from the parallel minor key. And in every case, the bridge always has a different harmonic rhythm than the A section. Harmonic rhythm is just a name for how fast the chords move in a song. The most drastic example of this change comes from Labyrinth Zone, where the A section's one chord every four bars is sped up to two chords a bar for the bridge. This is an extreme case though, usually we just see the harmonic rhythm doubled, like in Scrap Brain Zone, or quadrupled, like in Spring Yard Zone, or slowed down to half speed in Green Hill Zone and Special Zone. Changing the harmonic rhythm is a great way to contrast two sections because it feels noticeably different without changing any aspects of the music enough to risk them not fitting together. Finally, I want to talk about melodies. On the Sonic soundtrack, Nakamura typically writes melodies by creating a 2 to 4 bar phrase and then bringing this phrase either down or up by a step either diatonically, like in Green Hill Zone or Marble Zone, or chromatically, like in Spring Yard Zone or Scrap Brain Zone. Scrap Brain Zone is a good example of both, actually, so let's look at that. Our opening melodic statement is a simple 2 bar motif that starts on the 1 and ends on the 5. Afterwards, we immediately see this exact same idea moved down a step diatonically, meaning we just move every note down one step in the scale. Notice how the chord moves down a step diatonically too, so the melody notes hit the exact same chord tones as they did the first time. After this though, we move down a whole step chromatically, meaning we just take the two bars and transpose every note down a whole step, whether it's in the key or not. The chord does this again too, giving us a raunchy F7 in the key of A minor. Want another one? Okay. Here's Marble Zone. We have a 4 bar phrase made up of two motifs, a 2 to 1 rhythmic motif over the A minor and a 4 to 3 appoggiatura over the D minor with a little note in between. The next part takes this whole four bars and moves it down a step diatonically, giving us the same two to one motif over a G chord and the four three move over C. This kind of writing technique is called parallelism. In this case, diatonic parallelism, but that's just if you want to sound smart. You want another one? Okay, okay, one more. In Spring Yard Zone, the melody starts by outlining an A minor triad over a D minor 7 chord. This is called an upper extension triad because it is technically an A minor triad, but it hits the 9th, 7th, and 5th chord degrees of the underlying D minor. After this statement, we see the exact same phrase transposed up a whole step chromatically, outlining a B minor triad over an E minor 7 chord, before sitting on the sharp 5 of an A7 sharp 5 chord that brings us back to the D minor. This would be a case of chromatic parallelism, because the F sharp in the melody doesn't fit into the home key of D minor. 
Using these sorts of techniques for melody writing is an easy way to ensure your melody sounds cohesive, even if it lacks a little sophistication. If you start listening for these types of patterns, you're going to hear them all over the soundtrack. There's honestly a lot more cool stuff in the soundtrack that I could talk about, but I'll leave some stuff for you guys to find on your own. Leave your favorite Sonic song in the comments below, and thanks for watching.